I was, I wish, uh, I wish I could be there in Nepal with you guys. I mean, we've done this every year for the past couple of years. Um, and I wish I could be there. But here we are. COVID has changed so many things. As you guys are well aware, it's been a challenging year. We started this, I mean, last year we ended the year back in November, December, having our Better Together conference. It was so great there in Pokhara. And then all of a sudden, 2020 comes. It's been such a challenging year. COVID has changed the way that we've really operated as churches this year. We've been unable, you know, I'm not sure how it goes in the remote areas of Nepal, but in America, we've been unable to meet as a group physically together. We've been unable to meet until very recently. And it's forced us as church leaders to look for new and creative ways to engage with the Christians in our community. It's really forced us to be dependent on the Lord to say we need some new ways to communicate with the Christians in our community. It has not been easy here in America. And so I assume that in Nepal, you face the same challenges, that it's not easy to communicate with your churches, unable to physically meet together because of COVID. And then the longer this has lasted, discouragement starts to creep in to the body of Christ, but it also creeps in to the leaders, to us as leaders. We begin to feel discouraged. Will this ever end? What is going on? What is going to happen? The hardest thing for me personally, let me share with you, the hardest thing for me is to see Christians disconnect from the body of Christ. They disconnect. They break out of fellowship. They don't want to communicate anymore. And you start to see them drift away from the Lord with the pull of the world that's on them in their whatever they're going through. And then, man, how can you re-engage these, these Christian men and women, these families that have been disconnected without able to physically meet together with them? There's only so much you can do online. There's only so much you can do with a phone call or a text message or a messenger, whatever it is. There's only so much that you can do. And it can be very tough and discouraging as we see this happening to the church, not only in America, but across the world. And here's the thing, church, no matter what specific challenge you are facing this morning, here's the thing. God wants you to remain passionate. He wants you to remain passionate in the ministry that he has called you to. God is using this trial to prepare you as a leader and the church for a new time. There is something new. A new season is coming upon us. How are we to respond? I'd like, you, I'd like you guys to look at this quote here. I've written it out. We are not the first generation to face the challenges and trials of life. And if the Lord does not rapture the church in our lifetime, we will not be the last generation to face the challenges of life. Challenges are going to be part of life. And I apologize. I, I talk very quickly. I get excited and passionate about the word of God. So I'm going to give these notes to Jomesh. If you want them, all of it will be yours. You can just ask him. He'll email it to you because we're going to get into the word of God this morning because the Bible records a man of God a man of God who's coming out of great victory, a time of victory over the enemy, Satan. And he's coming out of this great victory and he falls into the trap of discouragement and despair and fear. He runs away. And I believe that in this event, God has a message of encouragement for men and women of God, for the church of God in times like now when it's easy to be discouraged. And so we have to remember that times of trial, are. we have four points 
this morning. The first point is very simple. In times of trial, the enemy has a goal. We have to remember that the enemy is trying to do something to us as leaders and Christians in times of trial. In the challenges we go through, the enemy is trying to do something. What is the enemy trying to do. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. I, I pray you have your Bible with you. I'm going to put it up here on the screen, but it's going to be very small. I'd like to, you to read. You'll be reading in your Nepali Bible. It's okay. Open with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. I will read it to you. You can follow along in the Word. It's going to be very small up here. You will probably not be able to read it. This is what the word of the Lord records. Verses one through four, Ahab, the king of Israel, told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. In chapter 18, the previous chapter, Elijah had just come down from the mountain of victory, having killed the prophets, the false prophets that were plaguing the land of Israel. He had killed them with the sword. The drought that was brought on by the Lord had been ended in a fierce storm that blew through Israel. It was an absolutely amazing victory by our King of Kings and Lord of Lords using his prophet, his man of God, Elijah. And then I have found it true, and maybe you have found this true in your own life, that when the victory comes, the enemy attacks when we stand in that place of victory, we find that the enemy throws those subtle, fiery darts at the leaders of God's church. And so often, if we're not carrying the shield of faith, we can fall to the temptation. And here, Jezebel, motivated by Satan, throws that fiery dart. I'm going to kill you, Elijah. You are a dead man. It's very interesting because Elijah, who had spent his entire life waiting on the Lord, waiting for the commands of his God, does he wait on the Lord in this instance? No. He follows his emotions rather than waiting on the Lord. He has a fear of man, and he runs away in absolute defeat what is the enemy trying to do to you in the trial of life? We know very clearly that what the enemy is trying to do in the trial of life, because we have the word of God. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse three tells us that no one be moved by these afflictions. The enemy's goal in afflictions is to move you. As a leader in the church, as a Christian man or woman, the enemy's goal in trying circumstances and afflictions is to move you. For, we, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. We are destined to go through trying circumstances or trials with others. We are destined to go through that. And when we go through these trying circumstances, the enemy wants to move you off of your sure foundation on Jesus Christ. He wants to push you off of that foundation. He wants your foundation to be a foundation of your own emotion. And this is what happens to Elijah. Elijah, the man of God, is moved. The enemy is able to move him off of his foundation on God. 
He no longer trusts in the Lord in this attack of the enemy. He's moved and motivated by fear. And where does fear lead? Fear leads to discouragement. Discouragement leads to depression. Depression leads to wanting to quit, to running away. Comparing yourself to the others that are around you in life, ultimately asking to die. I think it's very interesting. I'll give this to you as a free one. The very thing that Elijah wants in the depths of fear and depression is death. This is his desire. Elijah's desire in the depths of depression and fear is to die. The very thing that Elijah wants is the very thing that is totally out of the will of God. It is not God's will for Elijah to die. In fact, the very thing that Elijah wants is the very thing that will never happen to him. He is going to be raptured in the chariots of fire. I think it's so interesting that in that time of depression, the very thing that we want to see happen is most likely the very thing that is outside of the will of God for our lives. And so we need to be careful. We must be very careful. Do not let emotion rule you in the trial. Do not let emotion, fear, depression, anxiety, questioning rule you, master you in the trial. Do not compare yourself to the people around you. Do not be moved off of your foundation of Jesus Christ. Remember what the Lord says. The Lord says very clearly that there is a fact in life for, that's true for everyone that we must remember. And he tells this to Elijah back in 1 Kings. We're there in verses 5 through 8. And he, Elijah, lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. It does not matter what trial you are facing right now. Here is the fact of life according to the word of God. Whatever trial you're going through, a personal trial, a corporate trial, a national trial, a worldly trial, it doesn't matter. Here is the fact of life according to God's word, and the fact is very simple. The journey is too great for you. Do you see what the word of God says? The journey is too great for you. In your own strength, the journey is too great for you. In your own power, the journey of life, the challenges of life are too great for you. There is no way to be victorious following the Lord in your own strength. The journey is too great for you. We, as leaders of God's church, as Christian men and women, must understand this fact of life. The journey is too great for you. Therefore, if we want to see victory in life, Two things, according to the word of God, are necessary to see victory in life. And what was it? The first one was very simple. Arise. What was the command to Elijah? Arise. Wake up. Think clearly about what you are going through. Arise. Awake. Understand the Lord has a plan for each and every Thing that is going on not only in your life, 
not only in your community, not only in your district, but across the country, across the world, across the continent, the Lord has a plan and a purpose for everything that happens. So the only way to face the challenge the only way to arise is to be filled with the very Spirit of God. And we know this from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord, leaders. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. This is the word of the Lord to you. This is the Lord, word of the Lord to your church. Not by might. You cannot do it. You cannot be victorious in life in your own might. Not by power. You cannot be victorious in life in your own power, in your own flesh, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, that we must be filled with the spirit of God who gives us the energy and power to navigate through the challenges of the day. And therefore, you all know this verse. Paul commands us very clearly in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But the command is simple. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Be under the control and influence of the Holy Spirit in your life and in your ministry. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit because he will give us what we need each and every day of our lives. And therefore, we must arise, think clearly, and be filled with the very Spirit of God to navigate the challenges of life. And the second thing is also very simple. The angel told Elijah, eat, arise and eat, eat the food that the Lord has prepared for you. And as Christian leaders, you know very clearly the food that the Lord has prepared for you and for your families and for your churches. It's the very word of God. Here is the food that the Lord has prepared for you, the word of God, that we must feast upon the very word of God, believing and obeying his word. A foundation on God's word is vital to live the victorious Christian life. You all know Psalm chapter 95, verses 7 and 8. Today, this morning, this moment, if, you hear God's voice. You hear God's word. Do not harden your hearts. If you hear the word of God, do not harden your hearts. God is speaking now. God is speaking in the midst of the trial. God speaks all the time, 24-7. We must hear his voice. He's speaking through his word. Are you filled with the spirit of God? Do you believe his word and walk it out in obedience? Do you, as Elijah should have done, wait upon the Lord for your orders? Are you waiting upon the Lord? Because as pastors and leaders, you know very clearly Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. The idea is that you exchange your strength as you wait on the Lord for the strength of the Lord as you're filled with his spirit, that you will mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You shall walk and not faint. When we're filled with the spirit of, of the Lord, waiting on the Lord, he does something absolutely amazing. And what does he do? Leaders, you know this. I will remind it to you this morning that God, as you're filled with his spirit, as you walk in obedience, that God will bring you through each and every trial of life until that moment when God brings you home. Do you see what this is saying? That God is going to bring you through each and every trial of life 
until the day that you see your Lord and Savior face to face, until the day that God brings you home, you will navigate successfully through each and every trial as you follow the Lord until that moment when God brings you home. And as we go through the trials of life, God has a message for us. There is a message for us here in 1 Kings chapter 19. There is a message that the Lord gives to Elijah that we must hear. It's 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 14. This is a long one. And I'll read it to you. You guys all know this event, so you probably have it memorized. There Elijah came to a cave on the Mount of God and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountain and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, uh, and the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Notice in this passage, the question that the Lord asks two different times. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? And how does Elijah answer? If you saw in your word of God, he answers the question of what are you doing with why I am here? According to his own personal point of view, he's here because, man, they're doing all these terrible things in Israel. You don't know what the government is doing in my country right now, Lord. You don't know what's going on. And they're trying now to come after the churches, and there's nothing I can do. Elijah does not answer the Lord's question. He answers a question of what with an answer of why. And so the Lord has to tell him two times, what are, what are you doing here? Because the real answer to God's question to Elijah is that he is operating in fear. What was Elijah doing at the mountain of the Lord? He was running away. He was operating in fear. He had been moved off of the foundation of Jesus Christ. What was he doing? He was a man in fear. And so the Lord reminds Elijah, just like he needs to remind us today of how he works. Do you notice the four ways that God worked in that passage? The first way was the storm, the wind, the storm that came upon that mountain. The Lord brought the storm, and yet he did not speak at that time through the storm. The question then is, has the Lord ever spoken through a storm before? The answer would be very simple. Yes, the Lord has spoken through a storm before. At the end of chapter 18 of 1 Kings, the Lord is the one that brought the storm upon the nation of Israel, ending the drought and proving that he is God over the land by bringing the rain and the storm that came upon the land. The Lord has spoken through the storm. But in this instance, he did not. The next one was what? The earthquake. The earthquake came upon that mountain. The Lord brought the earthquake, and yet did he speak through the earthquake? No, the Lord did not speak through the earthquake. Had the Lord speaking through the, spoken through an earthquake, through mighty acts, through miracles before? The answer would be yes. Back in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, Elijah is there. And the Lord uses him to raise the widow of Zarephath's son from the dead. 
Elijah had seen the Lord work through mighty miracles, through mighty acts. Even the dead were raised to life. The Lord had spoken through mighty acts before, but not this time. Then there came the fire. The Lord brought the fire upon that mountain, and yet he did not speak through the fire. Had the Lord spoken through fire before? You're all familiar with this event because back in chapter 18, who brought the fire down upon the altar that consumed the fatted calf, that consumed the buckets of water, that consumed everything there? It was the Lord that consumed everything that was there through fire. And all the false prophets of the land were killed by the sword in that instance because the Lord can speak through fire. And yet, in this instance, the Lord did not speak. The Lord has used all of these things. He's showing Elijah something very important for us to understand, that the Lord speaks through all of these things. And yet he speaks in ways that we do not expect, nor do we look for. Because here, the final way that comes upon Elijah there on the mountain is a low whisper. And in this low whisper, in this small thing, in this quiet thing, in this little thing, the Lord speaks, the Lord moves, and Elijah is going out on the mountain to hear the voice of the Lord. The Lord is reminding his servant Elijah through this beautiful illustration that he works not only in the big things, but in the little, small, everyday things, the quiet things, the Lord is working in a powerful way. If only we would have ears to hear and eyes to see the things that he is doing. We must be reminded, as Elijah is reminded, that God works through all circumstances. God works through all circumstances, even the ones we do not expect. None of us expected a year like this. None of us expected 2020 to be one of the most challenging years for churches and for this planet. None of us expected it. And yet here's the thing, leaders. The Lord is working in our current circumstance because we know very clearly the Lord works in all circumstance to bring about his plan. And what is his plan? His plan is salvation for those who would believe. You all know from 2 Peter chapter 3 that the Lord is not willing for any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. The Lord's heart and desire is for his children on this planet to repent. He wants to bring about salvation to all who will believe. And we all know what's coming. There is an event that is coming upon this planet that the planet is not ready for. But we as leaders in the church, we as Christian men and women understand very clearly that Jesus is coming again. That his second coming is imminent and we must live understanding that the Lord could come for us at any moment. Are we going to be busy about our master's business until he returns? We as the church leaders must be busy about his business until he returns. And it's so clear. What is the business that the Lord would have you do in this time of trial when you feel discouraged, when you want to give up? Maybe when you are out there in the wilderness of life and you're saying, I want to die. I'm comparing myself to these other people and they have it way better than me. I just want to quit and leave the ministry. I want to give up. The Lord has a mission for you. And it's found here. The mission for us is found. The last point that we have this morning, it's found right there in the last two verses that we're going to talk about. First Kings chapter 19 verses 15 and 16 shows us the mission that we are to be on. And the Lord said to him, go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nemeshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shapat of Bethel Meola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. Leaders, this is vital for us to understand. Do not be distracted 
by the trial that you are going through right now. Do not be distracted by the trial that you are going through right now. Fulfill your ministry. Paul is very clear to Timothy. You all as leaders know this verse. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. As for you, church leaders, as for you, men of God, as for you, women of God, be sober-minded. Think clearly. Endure the suffering. Endure the challenge that's coming upon you as a leader. Do the work of an evangelist. Proclaim the name of Jesus to those in your life. Fulfill your ministry. The ministry that God has called you to does not change because of circumstances like COVID. The ministry that God's called you to remains the same. Fulfill your ministry. And notice, our ministry is very similar to Elijah's ministry. And what was his ministry? Elijah is called by God to minister to three people. You have the same ministry as Elijah. What was his ministry? Notice who he was called to minister, minister to. Three people. Number one. He's called to minister to Hazael, going to be king over Syria. He's called to minister to this gentleman. We are called, what we learn from this, we are called to minister. Hazael's in Syria, Damascus. They are enemies of Israel. We are called to minister to the enemies of Christ. There is a world that is lost and hurting, that knows nothing of the Lord, that hates the Lord, and yet we are called as ambassadors of Christ. Go read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, leader. You are an ambassador of Christ, as if the Lord is pleading through you to be reconciled to God. We are called to be ministers and to reach out to those who are lost, who are enemies of Jesus Christ. How else will they repent? If no one preaches, how will they repent? You are called, like Elijah is called, to minister to the enemy of Christ. And I find it very interesting that the enemy of Christ, Syria, we know is Israel's what? Neighbor. Syria was the neighbor of Israel. We are called to minister to our enemies who also are usually our neighbors. We are called to minister to the enemies who are usually our neighbors. They want to do, have nothing to do with God, and yet we are called as salt and light in the world. The second person we are called to minister to is Jehu. Jehu was going to be king over Israel. We are called church leaders this morning. Be encouraged. You are called to minister to your countrymen. You are called to minister to your countrymen and to your families. You have so much extended family in Nepal. You have so many relatives. You are called to be salt and light to those who are closest to you, which begins in the home. You are called to be ministers to the family. You are called to be ministers in your districts. You are called to be ministers to your countrymen. This is your ministry and mission given by the Lord. It was given to Elijah, and it's been passed down to us. We are called to minister to our countrymen and to our families. And finally, the most important call that we have on our lives is we are called to make Elisha's. Notice the last calling there of Elijah. He says, go and anoint Elisha to be prophet in your place. We have a high calling to prepare the next generation to serve the Lord. You have a calling, regardless of COVID, regardless of anything going on, to prepare the next generation of leaders to take up the mantle of the Lord and follow God. You have a high calling. Prepare the next generation to serve the Lord. Train up, mentor, disciple the next generation so that they can take that mantle of leadership when the Lord who began a good work in you completes it at the day of Jesus Christ and you see him face to face. You're called. 
to raise up another generation to serve the Lord. This is your calling. It doesn't matter how easy or how difficult it is. We are called to this. And if the Lord is for us, who can be against us? There is no one that can be against us. If we're filled with the very spirit of God, he will see us through each and every trial until he brings us home. And we hear those words from the mouth of our savior. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I live for. I want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. This is our command. This is our calling. This is our commission through the good times, through the bad times. Leaders, do not be moved by the trial you are in right now. Stand firm on your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The journey is too great for you. You must be filled with the very Spirit of God who gives you the energy and the power to overcome each and every trial and circumstance until he brings you home. God is working, leaders. Be excited in this time of challenge because God is working. Be on his mission, and we have the mission from him. You all know this as leaders of the church. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, Jesus comes and says to you, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. What did he tell Elijah? Go. What is he telling you? Go. Make disciples among all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You're not going alone. Your mission is not to be done alone. The Lord is with you even until the end of the age. Even until this age ends, the Lord will be with you. The Lord will give you the energy and power. Let me encourage you as we finish up this morning. You are involved in a great work for God. Leaders in Nepal, you are involved in a great work for God. Be on his mission. Minister to your country and family. It's going to be hard. You are called to be the minister to your countrymen and to your families. You, if you don't do who will? You are called. You are called to minister to your enemy and your neighbors. You are called. You are called to prepare the next generation of leaders in Nepal. This is your calling. Prepare the next generation of leaders. Prepare the Elishas to take the mantle of leadership. They are watching you to see how you respond to the trial of COVID. They're watching. They want to see, does, does Pastor Jomesh trust the Lord in the trial of COVID? Does Pastor Kieran trust the Lord in the trial of COVID? Because if Pastor Jomesh, if, Pastor, if they can trust the Lord, I can trust the Lord too. And the Lord's going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. What encouragement for us this morning. What encouragement for us this morning. Remember leaders. God will see you through the trial of COVID. God will see you through each and every trial that comes upon you, that comes upon the church, that comes upon your community, that comes upon the world. He will see you through until the day comes that he takes you home. You will get through each and every trial until that trial comes where God says, you know what, Pastor Eli, it is time to come home. The work is complete. Your job is finished. Well done, good and faithful servant. God will bring you. Leaders, we have to hear this. God will bring you through each and every trial that comes upon us in this planet until that day when he says the work is done, your job is finished. The masterpiece that I've created in you is complete. Come home. It's time for you to come home. 
And man, there's going to come a day where it's going to be time for me to go home. And I want to make sure that there's an Elisha to take up the mantle of leadership when I'm gone. I want to raise up a generation of young men and young women that know what it's like by experience, by seeing authentic Christianity lived out in reality. I want to live it out in reality because it's hard. Leaders, it's hard right now. But we as leaders must remain passionate for Christ. We as leaders must remain passionate for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because we have young, young ones watching. We need to show them what it's like that we can endure through the trials, that God has called us to this, that we will not be moved off of our foundation of Jesus Christ. Be encouraged this morning, leaders. You're involved in a great work for the Lord. God is using you more than you ever are going to know until you meet him face to face. And so, Father God, we thank you that we could have this time this morning. We thank you that we are better together, that we can stand shield to shield with each other, that we can be encouraged by your word, Lord. Would you continue that work in us? Forgive us, Lord, for those times where we have fallen into the trap of discouragement, to the trap of fear, to the trap of being moved off of the foundation of Christ. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to set the standard, to be on your mission, to minister to our family, our friends, our enemies, the world, and to raise up the Elishas, the next generation, that's going to take that mantle of leadership when we're gone and lead. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the cross, that because of you, Lord, we can have a relationship with God. Oh, what amazing, what joy. Lord, go before us. We commit ourselves to you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.